one. Hello, Wits. It gets it. All of his Flat Earth fans. Challenge accepted. The Earth ain't flat, bro. It's 2024, not 500 BC. Today, I read Marmot's paper, that which questions the foundation of special relativity and Lorentz transformations. But here's a twist. We're not just going to present Marmot's viewpoint. We're also going to provide counter arguments to give you a well-rounded perspective. Picture this. You're hurtling through space at incredible speed, and you start to wonder, with respect to what does light travel? This might sound like a simple question, but the answer can turn your understanding of the universe upside down. Paul Marmet challenges the conventional explanation, which relies on the mind-bending concepts of space-time distortion and time dilation proposed by Albert Einstein's special relativity. Instead, Marmet suggests we can explain it using good old Newtonian physics and the principle of mass energy conservation. No space contraction, no time dilation, just the basics. But hold on a second. Isn't this a radical departure from what we've been taught? How can light really be C minus V in relationship to an observer when all our instruments tell us it's a constant C, speed of light? If a spaceship were traveling in one direction at the speed of light and another spaceship were traveling in the opposite direction of the speed of light, in respect to one ship to the other, how fast does it appear like the other ship is traveling? Conventional wisdom may tell you that it is traveling at two times the speed of light. But according to Einstein's special relativity, you would be traveling at one times the speed of light away from the other ship. So even though they're both going one times, one times the difference from this one to this one is still one times the speed of light. It's not two times the speed of light. It's space-time bending to imagine, but our intuitions are wrong. As I delve deeper into Marmet's argument, we'll unpack his reasoning and explore how it's crucial in the world of the Global Positioning System, or GPS, and clock synchronization. That's that study like clock time tone, not the 12.00.00 you see on your clock. This idea of an illusion of constant light speed with respect to a moving frame is nothing short of mind boggling. Now, before you fully buy into Marmet's ideas, let's not forget that there are strong counter arguments. Critics argue that Marmet's approach might overlook certain experimental evidence and fail to account for the remarkable predictive power of special relativity. So in this episode, I will be your guide through this intellectual battleground. By the end, you'll have a better grasp of the complex world of physics and be equipped to draw your own conclusions about the nature of light and the foundations of modern physics. So grab your thinking caps and get ready for an exhilarating ride as we explore Paul Marmet's challenge to the established theories of physics and the counter arguments that keep the debate alive. I'm your host, Ozian, and this is Matters Now. This is a show where we talk about the things that matters to us all. Well, maybe the Flat Earth debate doesn't matter to you, but it does matter to me and to many of our fans. If you like this content so far, please show your appreciation by hitting that like button and share this live stream to your friends. I will be posting a link to StreamYard in the live chat and pinning it. And... If you want to stay informed of future content, then please hit subscribe. Marmer's paper reminds us how crucial it is to seek real explanations in physics, not just settle for equations that seem to fit. He talks about relative motion, how things change when you switch from one perspective to another. He says it's all thanks to the magic of mass energy conservation, which, by the way, leads us to introduce a little thing called a correction factor for measurements made in moving frames. Think of it as our way of keeping things accurate in the crazy world of physics. Marman is challenging the usual way we think about special relativity. He's seeing that maybe, just maybe, we can explain the weird stuff we see by sticking to the good old principles of mass energy conservation and Newtonian physics. It's all about understanding how things cause other things to happen in physics and being aware that when things move around, lengths and clock rates can change. And that's not as space-time bending as it seems. Now, 
let's talk about Einstein's clock synchronization technique. Imagine you want to measure how fast light travels in different directions. It sounds easy, right? You seem to burst a light from one spot to another and measure its speed. Well, not so fast. When you're dealing with moving clocks, it gets tricky and leads to some puzzling results. Those clocks are moving because the Earth is rotating. Here's the scoop. In one scenario, we have an observer who calculates the speed of light using the right units and methods following Einstein's footsteps, his field equations. A burst of light travels from point A to point B, and our observer calculates its speed by dividing the distance between them by how much time it takes from the light to get from A to B. Now, here's where it gets interesting. If you're on a moving train, the distance between A and B doesn't quite behave the same way as when you're standing still. It's as if the train itself is changing length because it's in motion. Clock synchronization enters the scene. We record that clocks at points A and B show when the light is at A and when it reaches B. But here's the twist. When you're dealing with moving clocks, we send light between two clocks. Let's call them alpha and beta and measure the difference in their displays as the light makes its round trip. The paper argues that this synchronization method leads to a difference in clock synchronization between alpha and beta, and this difference is responsible for something called the Sagnac effect, which can be a real head scratcher, but hopefully I can unpack that for ease of consumption. And guess what? This discrepancy isn't just theoretical. It's been confirmed in the real world, especially when we look at systems like the GPS. So we're not just talking about abstract concepts. Einstein's way of synchronizing clocks in motion leads to some unexpected results. But don't worry, these results are real. And we've seen them in action with systems like GPS, that idea of light speed changing when you're on the move. Well, it's all thanks to this tricky synchronization method. We're delving into the world of synchronizing clocks and measuring the speed of light. Does it really shake up Einstein's theory that light always moves at the same speed no matter what? Here's the scoop. Synchronizing clocks with the GPS. Imagine running experiments to check if clocks in different places can be perfectly synchronized. These are things I've actually done in the real world. When clocks are synchronized across meridians, like from New York to San Francisco, we notice a strange 14 nanosecond time difference because the Earth is spinning. Our trusty GPS confirms these findings. You know those geosynchronous satellites that orbit the Earth, those things up in the sky, what's it? And we even make corrections to keep things on point, keep that clock synced. Measurement of the speed of light as C plus or minus V. Experiments involving clock synchronization of radio signals reveal that the speed of light isn't always the same in different directions as we calculate them. When light travels eastward, like from San Francisco to New York, it appears to move slower, like C minus V, relative to the observer. But when it's heading westward from New York to San Francisco, it seems to speed up and move faster like C plus V. What does this all mean? Well, it suggests that the speed of light is only C when looking at it from a fixed, unchanging frame of reference. So he proposed an absolute frame of reference. Marmet takes a bold step and suggests the existence of an absolute frame of reference possibly connected to something called the 3K radiation dipole in space. So I believe this is in relation to the 3K background re radiation, or as most of us know it as the cosmic microwave background radiation. In other words, the universe exists and expansion is true according to Marmot. But pinpointing this absolute frame of reference isn't a walk in the park, and it's a topic for another day because it's way beyond my pay grade and the time I have to research this topic. But maybe one of our panelists will understand it. Our journey wrap up, wraps up with a bang. 
His paper challenges the very idea of space-time bending in Einstein's theory of relativity. It boldly claims that the speed of light is in a constant in all frames of reference, and those differences we observe are all thanks to those sneaky clock synchronization methods. Forget about the need for a mysterious ether, according to Marmet, to explain these phenomenon. So those laser gyroscopes, it's not the ether, according to Marmet, is um, about an absolute frame of reference. Marmet is proposing the existence of such thing, the absolute frame of reference. So there you have it. The experimental speed of light is seen from a moving observer is like C plus or minus V, and that is a game changer, right? Is it really though? Marmet presented experimental evidence and arguments against Einstein's theory of constant light speed in all reference frames, suggesting the existence of an absolute frame of reference and challenging the need for space-time distortion concepts. In order to perform these tests and experiments, it's crucial to recognize that we are assuming the Earth is a rotating sphere spinning from east to west. This rotation plays a pivotal role in the observed phenomenon we're discussing. One critical element in these experiments is the presence of satellites in geosynchronous orbit above the Earth. These satellites provide us with incredible precise GPS clock signals which are meticulously calibrated for accuracy. These signals are essential for our measurements and synchronizations. This is how we know it's that many nanoseconds. Now, let's dive into the Sagnac effect, a phenomenon that's at the heart of our discussion. It's how the laser um, gyroscope works. Laser ring gyroscope, excuse me. It's where light goes around in a ring and it measures the interference, the shift, because as it's rotating, they elongate, I believe, according to special relativity. Imagine you have a rotating Earth, and on this Earth, there are both a transmitter and a receiver of light. The Earth's rotation sets these components in motion, just like the inner workings of the laser ring gyroscope. Here's a key takeaway. The delays we observe in our experiments, especially when we're dealing with clock synchronizations and the speed of light, are a direct result of this motion caused by the Earth's rotation. It is not about the speed of light itself, varying as it travels east to west. These experiments rely on the Earth being a rotating globe, and the presence of geosynchronous satellites is absolutely crucial for precise measurements. The Sagnac effect, driven by the Earth's rotation, is a force behind the observed delays, and it's not about changes in the speed of light along different directions. This understanding is fundamental to the experiments and interpretations. You just have to take the time to read all of the citations for these papers, this one in particular, and read the rebuttals and refutations of the conclusions of Marmet in order to find out why the absolute speed of light has not been refuted by Marmet. That doesn't mean we toss out his paper, but it means we can add to the discussion and explain why we do in fact observe those effects that he brought to light. Either way, Marmet concludes that the ether doesn't exist and that the universe does exist. In conclusion, it's important to highlight that when individuals like Witsit argue that the earth is flat and appeal to the 2000 paper by Marmet, they might they actually are, unintentionally support the evidence for the Earth's rotation from east to west, the existence of space as a real entity, and ultimately contradict the notion of a flat Earth. Marmot's paper, while raising questions about certain aspects of physics and the nature of light, doesn't challenge the fundamental understanding of the Earth's rotation or the existence of space. Instead, it provides insight into clock synchronization and the behavior of light in specific contexts. Therefore, it's crucial to critically examine scientific claims and ensure that interpretations align with established principles and empirical evidence, what we observe, what we measure. In the case of Marmot's work, it doesn't negate the Earth's spherical shape 
its rotation, or the reality of space. Science continually evolves and refines our understanding, but certain fundamental truths, such as the Earth's shape and rotation, remain firmly grounded in empirical evidence and scientific consensus. By golly, we have pictures of the Earth from the moon. Cleanse, 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 cleanse. <laughs> All right. In this enlightening episode of Matters Now, I delved into the fascinating world of science, and you joined me. We discussed topics that intrigue both believers in the spherical Earth, such as myself, and those who lean toward the flat Earth perspective, such as Austin of Wits It Gets It. We explored the complexities of light, clock synchronization, and the Earth's rotation all of which offer intriguing insights. Whether you're a staunch advocate of the globe Earth or have reservations about its shape, I invite you to engage with an open mind and a friendly spirit. Matters Now aims to create a space where we can discuss these matters, learn from one another, and enjoy the journey of discovery together. If you've enjoyed this episode, don't forget to hit the like button, share it with your fellow enthusiasts, and subscribe to our channel. Your support fuels our quest for knowledge and ensures you never miss out on our thought-provoking discussions. So let's keep the conversation going with the panel and explore the wonders of our world one matter at a time. If you have any questions, tag Matters Now, and I'll make sure I ask the panelists if we have time and it's relative to the topic at hand. Thank you so much. Let's begin the discussion. Well, thank you everyone for putting up with that. Um, I I created a video because I, I researched this paper. I only spent the today researching this paper, um, but I thought it was a good way to get it out there to begin with. And I hope you all enjoyed that. It definitely ask any questions. We already got some panelists. We got the famous Mark Reed. Welcome, Mark Reed. Everybody loves that. Um, I used that um, short that Justin made as a trailer. No. For, <laughs> really okay well i'm glad i could help in some roundabout way that's that's amazing thank you for having me on ozzy and it's really good to be here and thanks everybody for joining us i, I you know it, it's one of those things you sent me the paper it was way too late to start reading it last night oh, yeah. like seriously it was like yeah but um the first thing i noticed about this paper that uh, well maybe you know I, I we'll go to there i guess uh maybe introduce dr j i like dr j hey dr j Hey guys, how's it going? Doing well. Um, yeah, good. And and um, maybe if if I didn't send the paper to you, Doctor J, but maybe you could comment if that video made any sense to you. If it helped you understand, like why there is a time difference going east to west versus west to east with clock synchronization. I tried mm -hmm. my best to explain what it was, but I'm not mm -hmm. an expert in. Yeah, and I. I uh, didn't catch the very beginning. Um, so maybe you could just help me like uh, put this in perspective for me. Like, so Witsit references this paper. The guy's name yes. is, what's his name? Uh, Mar, Mar, Paul I want to say Marduk. But <laughs> Marduk, I think, Marmet. is a god of somebody. Yeah, Marmet, okay. And he's referencing Marmet because he thinks Marmet helps him prove that the earth is flat. Because Marmet is questioning how we do time synchronization. Yeah. With clocks? Uh, he's questioning the theory of special relativity. So he's seeing okay. special relativity can be in general. Yeah, yeah, in general. Right. But the, so, the funny thing is, he right. still says, even though if there's an absolute frame of reference, just say there is, he still is saying the Earth is rotating and that is the cause of the effect um and like the earth is a globe because that's what he his paper references multiple times so joe wits it is just referencing this paper to say some people question special relativity and here's like a real paper that someone questions relativity 
Does that sound? I think his accurate? claim is a bit stronger than that. He's not just saying, "Well, here's somebody that questions relativity." He's saying, "I have a paper that shows how relativity is wrong," and the paper does not show that relativity is wrong. It doesn't. Yeah. It, it, but it's, it, it's it's a paper that provides an alternate um, model that hasn't been tested in any way, and we haven't. Um, so so you'll you'll see a lot of this in papers. People will put up a paper saying, "Hey, here is an alternative that needs to be investigated," or "This mm -hmm. this is a a, um, a you know an alternative," and people will take it as, "Oh, well, that's been proven. That is now theory." And it's not. It's just them saying, "Hey, here is an alternative that you know we could we could possibly investigate, or we we need to investigate." So people that don't sort of you know deal with scientific papers do this a lot. They'll read a paper and they'll go, "Oh, well, that absolutely proves it." No, it doesn't. No, it, unless unless they have sort of um, the the um, um, you know way that they've proved it in here, it it, it hasn't been proven. Mm -hmm. So if if let's just say this guy he comes up with this ultimate theory, special like relativity ends up being wrong. We do a bunch of tests, finds you find out that this guy's um, thing is correct. This guy still doesn't think the Earth is flat though. So Wits, it's kind of using right. a a sort of like I'm using this alternate theory to disprove one part of the globe model, even though the guy who is proposing this theory doesn't even agree with me. So we kind of pieces together little disagreements amongst the scientific community to sort of paint a picture that there's this big question on whether the earth might be flat around based on questioning different aspects of uh, physics or whatever. Well, that one correct? thing about Paul Marmot is I'm pretty sure, God, I don't know if it was William Lane Craig himself, but he's been cited by people who hold to the kind of cosmology that Craig does because William Lane Craig does not hold to like what modern, he doesn't accept modern relativity. And the reason he doesn't is because of time dilation, which only makes sense under a, a B theoretic, a tenseless view of time mm -hmm. where past, present and future aren't like actually real things. There's just time and things exist in it um, because that makes it much easier to attack the Kalam, particularly the, I believe, second premise of the Kalam. So he rejects like pretty much modern relativity. He holds out for some form of neo-Lorentzian relativity. So Paul Marmot has been cited by people like that because Paul Marmot is known for being somebody who opposes relativity theory, both special and general. He opposes the standard model of cosmology or at least big bang hypothesis or the big bang, um, the big bang model. And he proposes, um, he doesn't think that the universe is expanding either. I think that he proposes some form of tired oh. light to try to explain that. So, I mean, quite frankly, he's he's a crack. Like, he's not somebody that that I would listen to. He's written about this for quite some time now and has not overturned the field of physics. And there's probably a really good reason for that. I did that. So is he a is he a professor somewhere or you know i mean he's got a degree in, in physics yeah like i mean he's not like some nobody but just because you have a phd in physics and you say things about physics does not mean you're correct what is the consensus well, of the field and the data saying that's what we well, need to look at well and here's an example of that the citations so there's there's people that have cited the paper that say this is manifestly false this guy's in, in agreement so but in general, the, the consensus is, and there's only 13, 38 citations, if this was some world-changing theory or understanding of reality, it would have more than 38 citations. Yes. And, and you know, it, it's kind of, it, it's not, it's it's not, it's fine, but Marmot sort of cites himself a lot, his own papers a lot. And while that, there's no problem with that, like, don't get me wrong, there's no problem with that. It kind of raises a well. Why are you citing your own stuff so often? I, I don't know. It raises sort of a flag to me that this really needs to be checked. And from what you've said, it's you know other physicists have gone through and said, yeah, um, a lot of the the citations aren't correctly, um, or, or they're they're you know a lot of the stuff is incorrect. So um, there, there's a reason why we don't sort of just take. Um, the the sort of one person in science and go oh well they've got a phd in their field they've written a you know something about it that that's got to be the 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 truth it the reason why we go with consensus is because even among um the most learned people you got to get 
you know papers that are wrong it isn't it isn't sort of um you know and and you know if he's right it still doesn't add any weight to um Witsit's um cause because um th this paper and and it's called cherry picking okay so what he's doing is cherry picking a paper um this is sort of it's kind of a, it isn't an informal fallacy leo when when you cherry pick um something yeah that would be an yeah. informal fallacy yeah so wits it loves fallacy so let's point out what it is it's cherry picking he's basically taking a paper pulling what he wants out of it and not using the paper in its context and not accepting its conclusions because if he accepted the paper's conclusions the the frame of reference of the, the, the it doesn't say that the earth is stationary it says that the, there's a stationary frame of reference over the universe and earth is in motion rotating in it and earth is a globe in it right so basically mm -hmm. he's trying to cherry pick out things to say hey uh because if there's no bending of space time he can he can basically ride on well then there's no gravity kind of thing Mm -hmm. which I doubt that Paul Marmot would agree with that in any way, shape, or form, and his paper certainly does not suggest. Right. right. So, um, so, but he, no, just it, to be it, clear. It, it supports Newtonian physics. It says. Correct. It, yeah. So, so just to be clear, you guys aren't saying this isn't a real paper. This guy's welcome to write this kind of paper. It's fine. He, oh, he yeah. may disagree oh, yeah. with him whatever but there's a lot a of people paper. that have done it's, that mm -hmm. yeah sure so it, but we're just you're just saying but the way wits it's using it is so confusing it makes it sound like marmet is supporting things he's not really yes. supporting i actually learned a lot from reading the paper and looking up the refutations and why this special relativity is still so important like that's the biggest um conflict is it with this is it doesn't explain how special relativity has such strong predictive power and it does not offer a solution. It doesn't say what this absolute frame of reference is, so it doesn't give us any way to predict the future, basically, using his theory. We need to use the field equations to predict well, the it, future. Well, it, 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 you have to understand that this appears to be, at least to me, and I'm, I'm, I'm not a physicist, but it appears to be a proposed alternative to the Einsteinian model of of um, um, light, basically. Um, so that that's fine. Like people are allowed to propose alternatives, but it's got no um, sort of just because you account for uh, results of an experiment doesn't mean you performed experiments. Like it doesn't have anywhere where he said, "Okay, well, here's how we falsify this. Here's how we sort of um, um, show that this is the correct one." So. Um, you know, I, I, I really think this is just a proposed explanation and that's Marmot's personal view, which is, is fine. You know, it's his, it's his view it's, or rather professional view that, that, that is correct. But there's a reason why we go with consensus because, you know, there's PhD geologists out there who are claiming the earth 6,000 years old. You know, I'm, I'm looking at you, David McQueen. Um, we know that that's not true and, and he's come out and been very vocal about it. So we can't just sort of take one thing, but it is interesting. And, and absolutely, I'd be all in favor of, of, you know, testing this, this thing. Absolutely. Like, absolutely. We, we should find out if that is actually the case. But the, what, what I'm trying to get across is that even if this paper is true, it doesn't get wits at even one step closer to a flat, earth, a flat stationary earth. It doesn't because all of it, it's even got a diagram of clock synchronization on the rotating earth right like he 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 literally is saying um like the earth, we know that it, at one point he says we know the earth is a globe like I'm, I'm not even joking at one point he says that yeah i'm sharing the paper here where you can see his diagram for the earth rotating around yep. the sun orbiting the sun other stars um with the star frame the what was what's that called again there's a word i always forget it um the side oh, reel side reel isn't sidereal. It? sidereal sidereal thank you yeah i can't pronounce words anyways 
But yeah, so I the paper refutes him entirely. I, was, I noticed that a lot from people that read a lot um, and, and don't talk about the subject that much. Like people that read a lot mispronounce words because they read it, they don't say it. Yeah, I read a lot. Yeah, just like okay. the effect that you were discussing, Ozian, is the Sognac effect. The guy was French, Georges Sognac. Sognac. Okay. Well, I think, I, yeah, I think, I think the, uh, you know, Englishized, Englishized version is, uh, is well, fine. As long as people know Mark, what you're talking about, Leo. Would you ever go what? into a bar? Would you ever go into a bar and order a Cognac? Yes, I would. Do you, think, so do you think you'll get, or do you think you'll get looked at funny? I would uh, no, get looked think... at funny. I think I think the Australian bartender will ask me what it is. No, I'm I'm joking. Australian bartenders <laughs> out there, I'm, I'm so joking. No, no, I think it's fine. I think people just understand. It, the bartender will probably understand what I mean. Oh yeah, it's probably just... say, oh yeah, yeah. No, I'll get you a cognac. a cognac. That's not a problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. One cognac coming up. <laughs> we, we do I'm have gonna a do that just to spite you, Leo. I'm going to do that. <laughs> You we do it. have a question. Um, so why couldn't it be the case if if this 3K um, mm. radiation dipole thing is the CMB, um, right. why why couldn't it be a reference frame and the speed of light be uh, variable, I guess? Well, the, the CMB, CMB under the... Different. Well, yeah, and and in under the um under the um Einsteinian model and and the Big Bang model, it's moving, it's expanding. Yeah, that's that's right. another reason. So how would they even know where this that? And they talk about that in the paper. It's like it it has that problem too. It's like, what's this three K radiation dipole? Where's that at? Like, there's no explanation. That's for just that. a no really, explanation. really weird way of talking about the CMB because it sits, yeah. it's almost three Kelvins, and that's what the K is. Uh, I, I'm i not sure what the dipole there is supposed to be, but see, and this is just strange because th this is oftentimes what we get from quacks is they, they use really different terminology to, like, sound more big brained than they think they already are. Um, but the CMB can be a reference frame, but it's not the reference frame. So there are no the reference frames. You can't claim the Earth orbits the sun indefinitely. Um, what do you mean by indefinite? Like, you know, it's a stable orbit, but that doesn't mean it's, you know, infinite. I, I don't I don't know. What well, I think what he's mean. trying to say is that if the sun wasn't going to explode, like in a hypothetical universe where the sun will just exist forever and burn for it's not uh, don't ask why or how it's a hypothetical. The sun okay, just okay. exists forever. The Earth would orbit stably forever. Um, and that's true even in relativity. I don't know. Nothing about relativity says that's that yeah, can't I... be the case. Oh, yeah, Daryl's right. The dipole is an analysis. They have got the quadrupole, the monopole, the octopole. So, yeah, he's he's correct there. Yeah. Oh, thanks, Anna. Yeah, I did I did look up the definition, but I, not to the point where I had any understanding of it. Man, if you watch that video, that was my first time ever reading about it. It was 4 a.m. this morning, and, and I made put that video together, and... Uh, I mean, I have some understanding of physics, but it's like high school level. Maybe, well, not necessarily high school level, but like. Um, well, I'm glad you're here, Leo, because you understand way more about physics than I do, and and I I I I feel like my physics knowledge isn't as good as it could be. I, I really do have to have to do some more work on my physics knowledge, but um, I can so be a really good place to start. Yeah, sure. I'm, I'm all ears. Sure, absolutely. Sean, Sean Carroll's The Biggest Ideas in the Universe series that he has on his channel. I'm actually watching it again for the second time. Just And I just, it's very accessible like Carroll, to the yeah. non-professional. And that's one thing I like about Sean is he's yeah. very accessible to the non-professional in ways that aren't these... Um, um, you know, oft repeated cliche oversimplifications of what the physics is that you get from everybody else. Like he'll be a little bit more technical, but not so much that you can't follow along, but that provides for more of the nuances and the technicalities that exist in whatever he's trying to explain. And that's why I really that try to like mirror to him. Chat? I can't. Oh, it's a playlist. Yes. Yes. It's a playlist. Oh, beautiful. All right. Um, I might, Oh, I might link that. 
So somebody had a question because um, I don't know if you guys saw it, but Grayson went to Dinosaur Adventure mm -hmm. Land. Oh, that is so good. That yeah. is so good. I did a um could you could you I'll put this in the private chat. Could uh could somebody link it for me? Yeah. Just if 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 you are interested, that's you know it's uh, funny. Leo's man. recommendation for starting in physics, which uh, I desperately need. So thanks, thanks, Leo. <laughs> You linked it, and guess what color the link is? I'll give you a hint. It's not blue. I didn't even have to click on it. It's already purple. <laughs> I'm going to just open it. Wow. It's fucking oh, you, 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 that means you've you cached it because, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, post it again. All right. Um. So people, but, yeah. they brought up cosmic background radiation. Um, um, Grayson did in his debate with Kent Hovind yesterday i guess it was Boy, and I people ask they, there's like yeah i did a debate review as soon as i saw it like uh Boy. i'm not as much a review there was not to review grace and friggin nailed ken hoven it was like an interview of of uh ken hoven interviewing grayson for like an hour and a half um it was it was pretty good i only saw about the last 20 minutes of it but i could tell that grayson uh. Like, yeah, know, but Grayson is, well. is fantastic. Grayson's That's, fantastic. Yeah, the point is Grayson brought up the CBR and explained it in, in, in some detail. Um, yeah, CMB. Cosmic microwave background radiation. Thank you. And um, so how did we predict it? What is it? Where is it? Um, how do we detect? How did we detect it? Like, so... Like some people have questions about what does it really entail. As far as I understood it, it's predict is predicted by expansion and um, general relativity, and then we found it. Is that correct? Yes, it's it largely predicted, predicted by well, and the prediction of the cosmic microwave background is actually subtle. So people like George Lemaitre and some others helped develop the, what became what is now known as specifically the Big Bang Theory, which is only one aspect of modern cosmology. The whole thing is the Lambda CDM model. But um, if the universe is filled with matter and radiation, which at this point it would have been largely just radiation in the very, very, very early universe, then what happens is as the universe expands, it will cool. And all of the, the matter that's currently in the form of plasma and is coupled to radiation, that means that it's effectively photons and electrons were interacting in a way that at, at such a high energy level that you couldn't have separated them. They're, they're going to interact with each other. So matter is coupled to radiation. At some point in the future, the universe should cool under its expansion to a point where matter and radiation decouple. And what would happen during this, this moment, often referred to as Big Bang nucleosynthesis, is the first stable atoms would have formed. Hydrogen primarily with a little bit of helium and then trace amounts of lithium and beryllium. During this event, called the moment of last scattering for a reason, this would have been the moment that light radiation decouples from matter. And that radiation is finally capable of free streaming through the vacuum of space unimpeded. Now, if that's the case, we should be able to detect that radiation today. And in the 1960s, I want to say it was, 64, 65, something like that, um, Arno Penzias and, is it Robert Wilson? Penzias and Wilson were d using a telescope, looking out in the sky, he was trying to look at some stuff. They kept getting some interference, and so at first they thought, you know, there might be something on on the uh, on the actual telescope. It could be like bird shit or something like that. So it gets professionally cleaned. They recalibrate everything. They start looking out, and they get it again. It's the same interference. It's at the same level, regardless of where they looked in the sky, and regardless of how far out. Sitting at about 2.73 kelvins, it was electromagnetic radiation, microwave radiation permeating the whole of the sky exactly so they thought it was a fault we they thought it was a fault if in the, the hot um, big bang was true yeah. and that is the cosmic microwave background 
So the people that found it didn't know what they'd found. And they basically, they thought it was a fault in the dish. So they tried yes. everything possible to get rid of it. Well, they didn't think it was the pigeons. They thought it was the pigeon crap on the, um, on the dish. So they like scrubbed the dish of pigeon crap because they could not get rid of this thing. And it's a, it's a hilarious story because they tried everything they could, like replacing all parts, trying to get rid of this stuff. And what they hadn't realized and didn't know is they had found the background microwave radiation that had been uh, predicted that no one had been able to find. And so the yep. people that eventually got the Nobel Prize for it were the people trying to get rid of the sound, not the people who had actually theorized that its existence in the first place. <laughs> so it's just interesting. They, they got, yeah, they got the Nobel even though they had no idea what they'd found. We accidentally found the yep. uh, the decoupled electromagnetic radiation that last scattered off of matter roughly 380,000 years after the Big Bang, which itself is an interesting fact, because what that means is it wasn't until almost 400,000 years after the Big Bang that the first rays of light went zipping across the universe. Which is uh, cool. Yeah, it's a James Webb Tubble, uh, James Webb uh, Telescope. It's making some observations to the CBR that are unique. Is that the case or new, uh, better? Yes, I think primarily with respect to like galactic structure and galactic formation, because we didn't really know that much about that anyway. So, you know, there was some stuff that was kind of just, uh, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, it, it sort of, a word that sort of means like for the time being. What's the word I'm thinking of? Somebody help me out here. Um, preliminary or something? Uh, it's not tentative, but God damn it, what's the word? Um, so anyway, they, they just okay. decided to sort of put in tentative numbers and stuff. And we're like, okay, this is this maybe how the galaxies formed. And we're finding out that some of that was wrong because we already didn't really understand how galaxies formed. So it is doing work there. Uh, Daryl yeah, Frost and, and says it doesn't see cnb thank you daryl go ahead mark and, and i'm always like if we show that that i mean einstein may have been wrong in some of the stuff that that he said kind of thing just like newton was wrong in some of the things that he came up with i'm not against that i want to know what the actual truth of the matter is and that's what physicists are doing it's just that this paper doesn't show that to be the case necessarily and um you know it, it doesn't it doesn't get you to a flat earth and it doesn't get you to a lack of gravity and it doesn't it doesn't so we, we see this all the time in young earth creationists in particular um you know i'm looking at you donny if if you know who that is standing for truth so what they'll do is they'll cherry pick one thing out of a paper and say hey that proves that this this paper supports that that my conclusions so um, Donnie drives me crazy because he uses a paper called Switching Sides, how um, um, endogenous retroviruses, um, how viruses can switch sides to do things for our benefit. And he'll pick out that viruses have beneficial effects sometimes when they mute, you know, in, in, in organisms. And he'll pick that out and say, see, that shows that they were designed. And it's like, that is not the conclusion of the paper. And the paper is literally called Switching Sides, how the virus is mutates to help us that he'll pick that out and that is what cherry picking essentially is in in essence what you're doing is misrepresenting the paper because what what you're basically doing is you're picking out one part of the paper you're saying the paper supports my conclusions while making a different conclusion than the, that paper does not support wits its conclusions it doesn't right yeah. it supports that hey there is an absolute frame of reference and that relativity is slightly wrong that 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 um but sorry. the paper i would say I'm the paper's saying, conclusion is wrong. wrong yeah yeah hmm. um but that 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 sort of is where he can use that to say well then you know it supports that there is no gravity it, it, it no it, it doesn't support that it, no. it doesn't at all he actually um, says gravity is real and the Earth orbits the sun. Correct. Um, well, general. 
Sorry, go ahead, Leah. I'm, I'm if general relativity were ready. false, it's not like we're all going to start floating off the Earth. Like, what the fuck Correct. do people like? Gravity yeah. will still be there, and it will still mm -hmm. be something we have to <laughs> explain. That's uh, sure. general relativity is false. All right, guys. Oh, oh God, no, no, don't let me float off. Somebody help! Help! Is this the rapture? I do. What's going on? Thank you. Uh, mutable destiny. I'll know if the panel has the the knowledge to answer the questions. I definitely don't. I do. Um, okay, good. Um, what are the best accepted models that account for the slight anisotropies in the CMB? Anisocrates, thank you. In the cosmic microwave background, I imagine it would have to be related to primordial black holes for me very, very soon after the Big Bang. Man, what is with people in this primordial black holes thing that's like almost certainly not true? Uh, they're the result of the quantum fluctuations um, changing in scale as a result of inflation. Now, if he did, if mutable doesn't accept inflation, that's on him um, to show why it's not why we shouldn't accept it. But even professional cosmologists haven't fully been capable of doing that. I'm looking at you, Paul Steinhardt. And they are because you become famous if you can. But there, there are like um, six or seven papers that Witsit did a paper dump on. And you can't just read like all seven papers and understand them like immediately. Like this paper, I I, I like I got a general understanding of it. But it, for me to fully engage with this, it, it takes weeks to actually really understand all these concepts um, to build on it. But he can use this. He can manipulate his audience and say, look, look, look what this paper says. It says general relativity is is false, right? And it doesn't explain this known <laughs> phenomenon of this 14 nanosecond difference in the um, in the clock time. And it, that's just, a clock is a pulse, if people don't know that, that we use to synchronize stuff. People think clock is like the thing on their wall. It is also that. Pulses are well, anything can be a clock. The orbit of the Earth around yeah. the sun is a clock. Yeah. The rotation yeah. of the Earth is a clock. The, the right. most accurate ones we, we have are um, sort of changes in the quantum states of, of uh, uh, one particles. Three, Adam. Yeah, yeah. So so we, we change the, the states, uh, the quantum states, and that's how we measure time to the most accuracy. Uh, above that, there's the um, sort of radiation clocks kind of thing. Um, you know, th there's a few ways of doing it, but we're, we're getting more and more accurate with these these methods. Um, it's just, yeah, uh, it, essentially, it's just just a uh, measurement of changing of states, whether that's a quartz crystal um, vibrating or whether it's a, a, a change of quantum states, whether it's you know a, a radiation decay. It, it's all just change of states. So um, what I uh, think about this with me, like what if I were capable, which I'm not, I, I would theoretically want to know these papers if I were going to discuss it with Witsit. And then when he brought one up, I would bring out the paper, demonstrate he, how he's using it incorrectly. And then after that, when he referenced another paper, I would say something like, you know, Witsit, I'm just not sure you're a good, a, a good actor here, you know, like – Either you accidentally used this wrong and didn't understand it. So when you reference the other ones, I mean, we're not going to go through them all. I, I'm just, I have no confidence you're going to reference them correctly or, or you're doing it, you know, maliciously, but maliciously or on accident, it doesn't matter. You, you see how I've demonstrated, you referenced the paper incorrectly. Therefore, the audience should probably not be able to trust you when you reference all these other papers, you know, well, you know sure what I mean? You would, have to, you would have to know one paper really well and be able to demonstrate it that he's using it incorrectly in order to demonstrate to the audience that he's doing that, right? Yeah. Well, that's not the worst thing which that's been caught doing. He's also been caught, like, I've got a list of his citations from one debate because he brought up all these citations and they were very, very, like, I was like, holy crap, he's he's done his homework. Um, mm -hmm. They're not real. They're, they're, they're AI-generated citations that he he tossed out there. Or at least that's what I believe. So, I mean, I can put them in the chat if you want. They're sort of, you know, he 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 had them. But if you actually search for them on Google Scholar or or any scholarly um, finding, they don't exist. Mm -hmm. 
So being yeah. able to show that in real time in front of his mm -hmm. audience in a very nice way to show that he didn't do it correctly and therefore you're kind of having lack of trust in him, I think would require a ton of effort on the person debating him, right? Like you have to be so right. on it that you're, you'd have to, a ton of effort and then you know be able to speak in a very clear way to explain this quite complicated paper to explain why he's using it not correctly. And and he'd be yeah. blabbing big words the whole time, right? And it would be well, very tough. I, I think that's what you'd have to do. And I think kill, kill him where he's bringing up a – Wits is not here to defend himself personally, so we can oh, talk about it in generic ways. I think that's fair. Um, so okay. I would I would say I think – and I, I'm going to talk positively about Wits. Um, so Mickelson Morley, I had a chance to ask him some questions about the conclusions of the Mickelson Morley experiment when he was on the stage here the other day. And he was very honest about what the conclusions were when I ask the questions, but if you don't know enough about the experiments and the conclusions of the experiments, you don't know how to uh, um, break apart his argument. If you can and you ask the questions, he will in real time admit what the results of the paper works. I don't think he's, he's to me, I, I'm not going to say about that. I would say any person who's presenting a paper to draw a conclusion and they're not honest about both sides of the paper and and they're just leaving it's sort of dishonesty by um obfuscation by not explaining why it doesn't truly support your position you're just using it to support the idea and he will if you listen carefully he will admit that this paper shows that um general relativity is false he will say that <laughs> I would well, I, I, that. I just Kilman, get a bit Kilman. of a chuckle. I, I just, I just got to address this, Kilman. Uh, look, Witsit's, Witsit's open, like he can debate me anytime. I've got an open, Witsit can debate me on, you know, he's challenged me to a debate on evolution, backed out. He, he, uh, I've challenged him to a debate on, on flat earth. He's, he doesn't seem keen. He can debate me anytime on it. Um, the, the fact that he sort of avoids me is is sort of a bit frustrating because he says all of this stuff which I, I disagree with. Um, so I, I, I really, you know, he can debate me. He can debate Leo. He debated Leo recently. Um, I've got a I've got a funny feeling he probably won't again. But you know, if if, if he won't step up, then you know, I, I I I don't know what I can do. He's got a standing open invitation to debate me. And he said I, none um, of us would. He said none of us would read these papers. So I'm taking the time to go through all the papers he dumped, reading them one at a time, creating a response video. I'm going to have a live stream for each one. So the the next time that so this is a little bit about Witsit because this is his challenge. He challenged yeah. me to Openly doing this. Challenged us. Yes. So I am doing it. I am actively engaged. I mean, I said I would do it, and I'm being honest. I'm keeping my word to wits it. So I, I, I don't think. Uh... Yeah, I, I do get Kellerman's point, though. I do, I do get that point. They've got a very good point. So maybe we should just keep to the paper. And but we're know, only really it, talking. I apologize. Were you yeah. done there? Yeah, yeah. I sorry, I think there's a little. Yeah. I think yeah, there's no, no, just no, a couple good, seconds. Mate delay on my end uh ozian could i take about like maybe a minute minute and a half just to clear up some things in the side chat uh, I think what it's about? Uh, if you cover what it's about and then um your response so what's the question and what's the what's the answer well it's not really a question um there was just some comments that have been made that i wanted to provide some insight on because Go ahead. I, I just um the first one is is from immutable destiny and he mentioned something about um fluctuations in the inflation field being responsible for producing exotic matter that could lead to primordial black holes that's fine i don't know cosmologists that think that um what are the production mechanisms for this exotic matter and what is how is it that they turn into primordial black holes that would be the uh probably the main question most cosmologists would want to know i agree that primordial black holes are not a controversial uh topic they're just not highly accepted amongst cosmologists and i could be wrong but i think one of the reasons is that we don't have like really solid uh mechanisms for how they could um be how they could form so primordial black holes isn't something that most uh theoretical cosmologists are probably like heavily invested in um and Daryl says that both are impossible in the existing Lambda CDM model. I don't 
know how. Um, and he says there's not enough time for barred galaxies and black holes to, to form soon after the Big Bang. Um, we don't know that because we don't know how galaxies form. We don't know the means or the mechanisms through which they form to make statements about how much time would be needed in order for the galaxies to form. Supermassive black holes, it's the same thing. We are a little confused at how we're finding relatively mature galaxies and relatively large supermassive black holes only you know, 300 to 400 million years after the Big Bang. It, that is something that humans are trying to figure out but obviously there was some mechanism that did it because there they are it wasn't just magic so i mean will we have to modify any cosmologist will tell you the lambda cdm is not a complete model by any means but that doesn't mean that it isn't a useful and successful model that we can add to and that's just i just wanted to clear some of that up thank you leo um I'm probably going to keep this to an hour. Um, I was hoping Witsit or Flat Earther would talk would come on, um, so we could have a discussion about this paper in particular. But um, if they don't want to come on, they don't want to come on. Um, hopefully, someday in the future, when we do these other papers and these other discussions, they'll want to come on. But I really do appreciate um, all three of you coming here. If you have any closing words, uh, I do. Go I was ahead, wondering Leo. if in the last five minutes, since we didn't really touch on it all that much, if I could sort of explain what the Sonyak effect is and how it's actually a trivial result of relativity and not something that disproves it. Briefly. Yes. yes. So imagine you have like a ring with like a bunch of mirrors in it that can make light like go in a relatively circular way. Then you have a detector at the other end that can detect interference between those two um the two light rays because you're sending them in opposite directions around the ring they can meet and then they can interfere in various ways to tell us the arrival times of those beams of light now if you just do that they arrive at the same time but if you start rotating the device itself one arrives earlier than the other and people like Witsit and many others, and not necessarily flat earthers, but people like Robertson Genis, who is not a flat earther, but is a geocentrist, um, yes. are going to argue that this shows variance in the speed of light. And so special relativity must be false. But it doesn't show that. What it shows is that light, the, the light ray that is moving in the same direction as the device is rotating, will take longer to get back to the origin point than the, than the one moving in the opposite direction. And if you sort of visualize that with objects in your head, it, it kind of makes sense. If you're moving in the same direction, like think about a conveyor belt. If you're running with the movement of the conveyor belt versus against the movement of the conveyor belt, your speed is going to differ there. It's, it's something similar. The trajectory of light is either elongating or short shortening but the speed at which it travels is not changing. And they'll argue that the C minus V and the C plus V that's in the actual math means, oh, they're adding and subtracting to speed of light. It's variant. No, it's difference in the speed of light and the speed of the rotation of the device with respect to each other. And then that whole thing with respect to an outside inertial frame. So that's that's how that works. This is a trivial result. It does nothing to overturn relativity. That's just a complete misunderstanding of what's going on. Thank you, Leo. You did a much better job explaining that than I my hatched up attempt to do it. Actually, I thought your um thing at the beginning was really, really good. I liked it. Thank you. Uh, what about you, uh, Dr. J? Um, uh, you have any last words? I think this is a great exercise. I think you'll learn a ton if you really go through the papers. You'll you'll know so much, even if some of the things you learn don't have a lot to do with flat Earth. I think I think it's super great that you're doing it. You'll you'll learn a ton, and I appreciate going through all the effort not only to learn it but to try to explain it. So I, I think it's fantastic. Yeah, my goal is to break it down so I can understand it. If I can understand it, hopefully I can make it where other people can understand it. So. Um, and what about you, Mark? Let people know about your channel. Um, everybody loves that short man, that that um, Kent Hoban impersonation. You know what's so great? When I did the Grayson uh, debate review with Kent Hoban, I, I showed your short first because I was waiting for people to come. It's like, we got the Kent Hoban Grayson debate. Here's Kent Hoban. And it was you for a minute. That was so hilarious. Uh, you guys, you guys are terrible. Uh, no, you're awesome. I love you both. Um, look, uh, and and, and uh, I love the other hosts. I love Earl. I love uh, Justin. Uh, all you guys. Um, look, I, I I think I mean, Witsit. I, I 
it, it's not bad to read these papers, even if you disagree with them. That's the thing. Like, it's good. And as you said, you learned a lot. So, you know, yeah, I kind of agree with Witter. We should read these papers. Even if we don't understand them fully, it gets questions going. Like, what does this mean? What does that mean? There's no, there's no bad thing about that. But I also think that maybe Flat Earthers should read this paper as well. Because, you know, it doesn't... It doesn't say what they they want it to say. I'm really sorry, guys out there. It just it doesn't say that. Like it it basically reconfirms the shape of the Earth as being a a globe or oblate spheroid, and it reconfirms that the Earth is rotating not only around the Sun but rotating on its axis. It's not only revolving, sorry, around the Sun; it's rotating on its axis. So um, I think that what's true for us that we should read it. Yeah, absolutely. But please, you guys, read it too like seriously thank you very much mark i think i'll leave you, you with the last um word there on the topic um i just want to do some closing notes um i'm going to do more of these shows i have a debate coming up on friday against caleb he's a tiktoker twitter um about the flat earth of course and uh it'll be a modern day debate 5 p.m eastern standard time we'll do a pre-show max will be hosting and he'll also be hosting the after show I'll definitely show up to the after show. I might drop in to the pre-show for a few minutes. So hopefully you guys can watch it this Friday. I'm hoping to make more content like this this week, but I have some other stuff I want to do too. I, I, I've i spent like, I woke up at 4 a.m. and started this and I took a, an hour and a half nap. So I've been doing this since 4 a.m. today because I care about this <laughs> topic and I care about this channel and I do want to understand it. I want to do what's good um, and right for this community and the people and i hope people appreciate it enough where they can like share and just subscribe to this channel let other people know about this content and come to our future shows hit the notification bell and stuff like that so with that thank you very much everybody for coming i'll see you next time bye bye